One notable thing on the uh, Pleasant Street original YMCA was that it was really literally falling apart. The roof was leaking, the uh, basement was leaking, and uh, it was not handicap accessible. Down in the basement was our free weight room. One guy was lifting weights one day, and this old window just fell right on top of him. There was no teen center, there was no parking, and the building was basically 90 years old ready to be torn down. My son learned to swim at the old Y. I carried the bucket seat up the stairs with the baby in it, um, those steps. With my real estate experience and financial experience, I tried to find a role where I could fill on the board, and that was a land search committee for a piece of land for the new YMCA. Dave was um, very insightful, very persistent. Uh, they had gone up a bunch of dead-end alleys and they, they had great vigor in doing it, and, and Dave was not about to give up until a proper site was found. When we did the original deal with Forest City where they gave us three and a half acres, we were really excited. Our dream was having this beautiful little facility on the water in a campus setting where we could take advantage of the natural setting of the water walking trails and everything that you have up in Lakes Hill. In a partnership uh, like ours with Forest City Development, we were attractive to them because if they couldn't get their permits, they could put the property to us, which meant that they could, for a pre-described number, sell it to us. Dave suggested to them that, hey, if they have a put, we'd like a call. And, and a call is simply, after a certain period of time, if the deal is not cemented, we could say, hey, Forest City, we'd like the whole property. And in fact, that is what happened. We gained control of the entire site, 21 acres. All of a sudden, we have the opportunity for this larger piece of property to develop this bigger Y of a Y that there isn't another Y in New England that size and convince everyone, oh, we can do this. The spirit, the drive has to come from the local volunteers. And Bill Adams was, was really the primary driver of that early on. And he and his wife, Carol, met with Ike and Rosemary and asked them basically for two things. Asked them for a lead gift, which was certainly something we needed. And secondly, asked them to help in other key uh, solicitations with some of the other key donors. And both Ike and Rosemary were not only said yes to the first, but said yes to the second, and were integral in getting Peter and Carolyn Lynch involved, as well as Henry and Belinda Tamir. When you're gonna do a project like this, it's like creating the right stew, and you have to have all the right ingredients. And you need amazing volunteers who have tenacity, knowledge, and they have ownership. I thought we really need sophisticated board members and so at that point if you remember the dream team this goes back to Larry Bird and Magic Johnson and all the great basketball players they had played in the Olympics and they called it the dream team and uh, so we put a collection of board members together which I call the dream team which included Peter Lynch, Ike Van Arler, Henry Tremier, Dan Doherty, David Gardner, and Phil and people from the highest level of different services that we needed to accomplish this. Jeannie Lampkin came in and wanted to volunteer. As he started to explain this massive campaign to raise money and this moonshot project to put a new building on a hill, I got really interested. I told him the kind of ways that I worked with Fortune 500 companies to do very large, very complex projects and keep all the people moving in one common direction. And between the land, the construction, the funding, the multiple town municipal board regulations, this was like the Olympics of complex projects. Well, we broke ground in 2006. This was a very difficult project from an engineering and construction perspective. 
It, you know, as we all know, it was built on ledge. And of course, it was one challenge after another as we realized how inhospitable <laughs> the site truly was. We were running into all kinds of cost overruns and, you know, there was a lot of pressure on us to make sure that we were, you know, doing our best to contain the costs and continue to fundraise. And one of the folks that was on our campaign committee, uh, Buck Weaver, he said, hey, Paul, do you want to present to Swampska Rotary? He said, yeah, one guy, Dave Sherman, um, uh, said he was interested. I had all the conceptual drawings, did the dog and pony show for everyone. And then afterwards, I went over to uh, Dave to see if we could set up a time to meet. Now, at this point, he kind of raised his voice and said, this is never going to happen. I've been hearing this for 20 years. Get out of here. But surprisingly, you know, something resonated with him. A few months uh, before we opened, we were still short uh, uh, on, on the campaign, and uh, Dave passed away. And Paul Gorman called me and said, there's this gentleman called Sherman who had passed on. He said, guess what? He left us a million dollars for the YMCA. And I almost broke down in tears because we, at that point, we did have about a million dollar gap. We had no idea where it was gonna come from. And then two months later, Paul Gorman called me again and said, guess what? I said, what? We got another million dollars. So he ended up giving like $2.1 million. I guess the, 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 the gist of it is, you know, if you can start to have this persistence and build credibility, it resonates, especially in small communities. When we came from the Pleasant Street YMCA to this YMCA, we knew we were going from a 3,000 member YMCA, we thought to maybe a eight or nine or 10,000 member YMCA, and it became even more than that. It became 11 and then 12 and all the way up to 15. So what I did was to create space so the leaders that led all the programs, gymnastics, swimming facilities, we would just take a time out and we would talk about and try to envision what is it going to be like. We needed to come into this knowing what we were going to be faced with. Here it is, the wise open, there's people everywhere. How did that make you feel? I was proud as a peacock and I really didn't deserve it because I've had such a tiny role in the whole thing. but. I walked around like it was my home and I'm the homeowner and I had worked forever to get to this point. The energy that this building had, you know, and it wasn't just the building, it was the people and the community. I looked up at the building and the lights are on and it's alive and I just was so, I, you know, wow, we did it. And I think everybody who's been involved in it, um, which are, you know, a hundred people, uh, is probably one of the proudest events in their life, uh, regardless of the success they've had outside their life in business or other professional organizations. This why has been beyond our wildest imagination successful. If you didn't have this significant sized building, you never could afford these programs, you know, where health programs, senior programs, teen programs, daycare programs, and it, it has a platform which opens up the venue of support programs for almost every community need. I'm living here. Uh, I grew up here. I'm gonna live here afterwards, so I wanted to make sure everything, I wanna maximize everything that we could. There's no organization that you can get involved with as a volunteer that's going to touch as many aspects of your community as the Y does. The people that I've met who have been here for many years and some of the bigger projects, the building, I think the success of the volunteers comes with persistence, perseverance, <laughs> and longevity. <laughs> My 20 years volunteering for the Y have been the most fulfilling. Uh, it's been one of the most fulfilling things I've done in my life. And it's, with the exception of my marriage, it's the longest thing I've done in my life. <laughs>